Uh, my name is Eric Musel. I'm a structural engineer for the POL MCX uh, out of Omaha. I'm a licensed professional engineer and a certified API 653 inspector. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, common deficiencies in recently constructed vertical storage tanks. Um, a little side note on the title, when I say recently constructed, I also mean recently repaired. Um, those two are kind of one and the same thing. So we'll jump right into it. Um, I have a standard disclaimer that I'd like to read off before I get started. Uh, all photos used in this presentation were taken myself and not copied from any inspection report. Photos depicting deficiencies are in no way intended to single out any specific contractor or subcontractor. These are common deficiencies and the photos used are only intended to provide examples of specific instances of common deficiencies seen during construction or inspection. So I'm not trying to make anybody look bad with any of these pictures. So. The way that uh, the Corps of Engineers likes to categorize their repair items are um, into these three um, repair types, the mandatory, the required, and the recommended repairs. And I'll give a brief overview of each of those types. The mandatory repairs are typically not ones that are construction deficiencies. Um, they are typically things that are general wear and tear on the tank. Um, and I'm not going to go over those today because those are not construction deficiencies. Um, but they do um, represent a major risk to the um, system operators, the equipment integrity, or the adjacent environment. Typically, they will keep the tanks out of service until they are resolved, um, but that is always up to the service control point. They have to take into account mission requirements um, and other risk factors, whether or not they want to take tanks out of service or just repair them as quick as possible. Um, the API 653 inspector and the Corps of Engineers are only providing recommendations as to whether or not the tank should remain out of service. We do not make that call. That is the service control point in DLA. Um, so some examples on there um, that I'm not going to go over today because those are not construction deficiencies. Um, and then the required repairs, which is going to be the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today. Those are the more short-term repairs that are typically caused by a construction deficiency that will have to be corrected whenever the tank goes down for hot work repairs, um, hot work being welding repairs on the tank. Um, they can typically be returned to service. Um, they're not major issues, um, but there are things that you would want to correct within three to five years. Um, so tanks can be returned to service after these items are repaired. They don't have to hold the tank hostage and keep it out of service. Um, there are some specific examples in there um, that, again, are not typically caused by a construction deficiency, but they are items that we would want to see on an inspection report. Next is the recommended repairs. Um, these are more long-term repairs. Um, a lot of them are going to be um, non-construction deficiencies. They're typically due to code updates, UFC updates, local standards, stuff like that. The uh, bulk of them um, that we would see in an inspection, I'm not going to go over today because they're things like containment area grading, um, fire hydrants not being close enough to the tank, things that we would not do in a tank repair type project, but they would need to be updated um, in a more um, broader scoped SRM project or Milcon project or something of the sort. And then a quick overview of what API 650 and 653 are. 650 is the new construction standard that all tanks that we build now are built to. They're going to um, dictate the uh, design, fabrication, erection, and inspection of tanks. 653 is what covers tanks, the inspection and repair of tanks built to 650 and its predecessor, API 12C. Um, and that covers the uh, inspection, repair, alteration, relocation, and reconstruction. They overlap heavily. One references the other quite a bit, um, and so they are both very important to uh, above-ground vertical storage tanks. So we'll get into the common mandatory repair types. There's really only one that I'm going to talk about today, um, as it is a major one that is caused by construction deficiencies um, that we currently have several tank repairs out there for encompassing almost seven tanks that we have to take out of service and repair, and that is the, the tank chime projection. A lot of times this will be cut back as they're trying to make way for other appurtenances, anchor bolts, and things like that, and that is something that is not acceptable per API 653. API 650 there on the right side gives the minimum requirements for a new tank, which is what we would want to see. We'd want to see at least a two inch projection beyond the shell of the tank to the end of the chime, the chime being the bottom plate that sticks out past the shell. Um, if there is a low type repad, which that detail there on the right shows, uh, you'd want to see a minimum half inch from the toe of that weld to the end of the chime. And that is the minimum requirements for a newly constructed tank. As we go out and we inspect a tank, 653 would govern, which is the detail on the left. 
which requires at least a minimum 3 8 inch non-corroded distance. So if it is actively corroding and it's right at that 3 8 inch, that's an issue and we'd want to correct that. If it's at 3 8 of an inch and there is no corrosion, it's coated, it's sealed, it's not an issue. But if it's cut back to less than that, then that's a mandatory repair that we then have to take the tank out of service. And like I said, I think we have uh, three separate repair contracts encompassing seven tanks for this issue alone, and most of them were built within the last 20 years. And so it's a very expensive issue. Uh, this is Robin's Tank 28. Um, as you can see, it does have at least a minimum half inch projection um, beyond the repad, which you can kind of see up there. Um, this is the other side of the tank, which does not have the projection. They laid out their plates a little off, so that has barely even a quarter inch projection beyond the tank shell. That's just the tank shell, not a repad right there. Um, so this is a tank that had other issues with the bottom. We decided to correct them all at one time, slot in the second bottom and correct this issue, but still very expensive construction deficiency that we had to fix. The other time that we'll see um, the notches cut in is around anchor bolts. This is at a uh, Westover tank 26. This one, um, it appears to be good just looking at it. It has um, at least two inches projection beyond the tank shell right there until you look closely at the anchor bolts in there. And then you can see um, it is notched in there to within an eighth of an inch of the toe of the weld. And you can even see just on the uh, right side of my tape measure, just before the anchor bolt there, there is a bit of a crack starting to show up in that bottom plate. Um, it doesn't appear to be leaking fuel, but it is something that uh, we do not want to leave unfixed. So this was a tank that we had to, um, I believe, replace the annular ring with it all the way around with it and its sister tank. Uh, this is a newly constructed tank at Grissom where they notched the tank shell around the leak detection well. Um, this was one where thankfully they did have the required 3 eighths of an inch. This is before they fixed it. Um, but the toe of that weld, as you can see, it's uh, no fault of the welder. It's a very close proximity to, to an item there. It's tough to weld those things. So they had to go in and kind of doctor up that weld to make it still meet the minimum requirements of the weld profile for that uh, fillet weld while still then providing the 3 eighths of an inch. Conveniently, my tape measure is 3 eighths of an inch wide, so it makes it easy to measure something like that because otherwise it's very tough to check. And this is before they corrected it, obviously. And like I said, there are other types of mandatory repairs that I'm not going to go over today because they are not construction deficiencies, um, but there is a long list of items that will take a tank out of service and keep it out of service. And I've listed just some examples there. And then I'll move on to the common required repairs, and these are going to be the bulk of what I'm going to talk about because these are required to be fixed, and then the tank can remain in service while these are um, an issue, while we get a repair contract uh, put together and executed. The first one that I'm going to go over is the weld spacing around connections. Um, this is API 5.6, um, the table that uh, describes weld spacings. Uh, most of the information that I'll be covering today is for tanks that are shell plates that are less than or equal to a half an inch. Um, the ones that are over half an inch we typically don't see in Army and Air Force service. Uh, there might be a few in the Navy service, but we don't deal with those all the time. Most of them are the details that you're going to see in and around here. The F and G details we don't see very often, so if there's an issue with that it's not common, and so I'm not going to go over that. But those are the uh, that is the, the figure that dictates what weld spacing should be in API 650. And this is an issue at uh, Langley Tank. It is less than the six inch required minimum. Um, it only has uh, about five, five and three quarters inch there. So that is something that is a continual maintenance item. They have to remove the coating, do magne magnetic particle testing every time that tank is uh, um, taken out of service for inspection. So that is something that the repad has to be widened to encompass that shell weld. And it is uh, an expensive fix for something that should have been done right the first time. And this is an older tank, so it's, it's not a recent one, but it's an issue we do see a lot. One that we'll see a lot more often on uh, recently repaired tanks, especially when they have a second bottom slotted in, as you can see on this one at Homestead. The uh, nozzle is raised up to a new elevation. Three inches is the minimum required separation between the toe of each weld. As you can see, between the plate and the repad, they've got three inches, but it's the toe distance that actually matters. And so they do not have the three inches there. Thankfully, the fix is pretty easy. It's just putting on a low type repad, easy to fix, um, but it was every nozzle in this tank was done. Uh, the, the person laying it out didn't 
know what they were supposed to be measuring. So um, it's something that we see quite often. The next one that we'll see a lot of times is the spacing on floor uh, patch plates and reinforcement plates. Um, this is figure 9.13 of API 653. It's something that in recent repair scopes we have to call out specifically just to make sure that the contractors are doing this when they do repairs. It's a pretty simple thing to make sure that you have a minimum two inch clearance between patch plates or repads um, and any shell uh, or um, floor butt or ah, any floor lap weld. Um, that two inch clearance is typically what is required. This is an example again at Grissom of where they didn't have the uh, minimum required two inch clearance. Um, they didn't really have much of a clearance so they had to remove the coating, do a magnetic particle test to correct that. It would be just as simple as taking this repad, shifting it over a little bit, giving yourself the two inches of clearance and that is just something that they have to do in the field as they're laying out these plates. Typically does not require a larger plate or any kind of refabrication of plates, just laying it out properly. And there's another one where it's a striker plate for an internal floating roof put pretty much right on the weld. That is something that would then have to be coating removed, magnetic, magnetic particle testing performed. That's not something that we would want to remove the plate for because if I remember right, I think this was a um, steel pontoon floating roof, so it does have a lot of weight on that striker plate. So we would want to make sure and keep it uh, there so that way there's not excessive wear on the bottom plate. But then that is going to be something that it could be um, something that fatigue cracks could start to show up in that bottom weld and then start leaking fuel. Another one that we'll see um, quite a bit, especially due to changing OSHA regulations, is the stair clearance around obstructions. API tables 5.17 and 5.8 are the most, um, most stringent requirements for stair clearances. OSHA is actually more relaxed than API. And so those tables give the minimum width of a walkway to be 24 inches after taking into account all projections. Projections like the high level alarm system, wind girders, um, high level control valve, things like that. And then uh, table 5.18 states that the minimum width of a stairway shall be 28 inches. And that is just regular width, doesn't take into account any projections. Those kind of overlap because a stair is a walkway. You do walk on it, so it has to be a minimum 24 inches at all projections. This was a tank at Scott Air Force Base that was recently repaired uh, within, I think, the last 15 years where they put on a new stair platform, but it was not provided the correct amount of clearance between the high level um, system uh, vent or drain right there. And it had only about 18 and a half inches from that stair handrail. And that's a, a, a difficult fix because then lengthening that platform, then you have to readjust all of those stairs leading up to it or move the high level alarm system over and then adjust all the stairs up of, from that way, that, which would be behind me in this picture. It's a very tedious fix to have to do, and it's something that due to OSHA changing their regulations, and that's probably why API put out their more stringent requirements just to make sure that OSHA doesn't leapfrog them and then have something more stringent. And this is the sister tank to the Scott Air Force Base, which was not repaired at the same time. But it does show how you can have a stair going up the tank that does not have a platform, that has uh, barely even 16 inches of clearance between the system drain. Um, even going up there, I almost smacked my head on that. It's, it's something that is easy to see when you're inspecting a tank, but it's a little harder to fix because that requires removing the stairs, putting in a platform, but because we typically don't want to put widened stairs on tanks because there is a six foot four maximum requirement to the system vent and that is usually hard to accomplish on stairs that are moving down and the system vent will be up on the left and so a platform is what would be required for that but even then we'll see um, we'll see stairs that are installed and widened but they are still widened to OSHA requirements and not API requirements. OSHA only requires a 22 inch width of stair after taking into account any projections. So we see a lot of stairs that are only 22 inches wide, they should be 24. Another one that is uh, more specific to uh, DOD tanks um, because API technically allows threaded plugs and nozzles for MPS 3 quarter inch to 2 inch 
Uh, we don't like to see those on the lower shell courses of tanks because they have the tendency to weep fuel um, due to the hydrostatic pressure that's up there. Up on the higher shell courses, and especially the roof, the roof especially should not ever see any fuel. The higher shell courses like the high level alarm system, if it's threaded, it's existing, and putting in a patch plate over an existing penetration could turn into a massive patch plate to take into account well. We can just leave those threaded connections in there. They really shouldn't see a lot of pressure from fuel up there. But they are allowed per API 650. We just don't like to see them. This is an example of an old temperature probe at Robbins Tank 28 that had a threaded plug installed. Um, thankfully, they put the coating on pretty thick so it's not weeping fuel. That's probably what's keeping it in there, but that would have to be repaired by a patch plate, especially since it's abandoned. And this is an example on the same tank at Robbins um, where it was a sample connection port that was threaded. You can tell it is weeping a little bit of fuel there. So that is something that we would either, if the installation wants to keep using that sample connection point, which I believe they didn't, we would have to install a new nozzle, a socket welded nozzle, something like that, to keep that from weeping fuel and still maintain the operability of that sample connection port. I believe with this one, we're just patching it because they said they did not need it anymore. But then there is a repad right next to it, so then when they patch it, have to take into account weld spacing requirements on that. I'd uh, talk about the non-compliant shell nozzles. Um, these are the nozzles that don't comply with the figure 5.8 of API 650, which gives um, uh, shell to flange face requirements and also height requirements. Um, and that the shell to flange face clearance is uh, one that we see a lot of times. It's easy to correct in shop drawings. Uh, but if it's overlooked, then it uh, becomes a hassle in the field. API requires or is, is a little vague on where you're supposed to measure that shell to flange face distance. Um, a lot of inspectors take it as a center line. We like to see it from whatever the nearest flange face is. So if the flange is not, or if the nozzle is not going through the shell at a 90 degree angle, one side's going to be a little closer than the other. We see this on the low suction lines and the water draw off lines. This is a um, figure 5.8 out of API that gives the requirements. On the right side is for flange nozzles that are NPS 3 or larger. On the left side is the 3 quarter inch to 2 inch. Um, and the um, 3 quarter inch to 2 inch also have some extra stipulations based on the thickness of the tank shell, something that's easily overlooked. These type C and type D, they give a 3 eighths inch maximum shell thickness. So if it's more than 3 eighths inch, you cannot use the type C or type D details, you have to use type A or type B, which have welds on the interior of the tank, which I'll show a picture of a tank that was a half inch thick that did not have those welds on the inside. So this is at Westover. Um, it has a three inch thermal relief, or thermal relief line that you can see is piped directly into the tank shell. It appears to be a socket welded connection from the outside, which I believe would be uh, something similar to that type C, which that tank has a half inch thick tank shell, so that type C is not even allowed. But then when you look at it on the inside, it appears to be more of a type D type connection where you can see the in interior piping of that three inch and then here's the tank shell. There is no weld on the inside. So that being a half inch thick tank shell, we have to cut that out, put it in an insert plate because the half inch has different requirements for patching holes in the shell and then that would be replaced with our standard one inch thermal relief line that could then again be um, piped directly into the tank shell as long as it complies with API 650 for the half inch thick tank shell. There's an example at, at Grissom where they did not have the re minimum required shell to flange face standoff distance. This is after they repaired the issue. So they have the seven inches, and this is what I was talking about, where if the pipe doesn't come in at 90 degrees, you're gonna have more than required over here. You might have seven inches here, but then you're only gonna have about six and a half over there. And that is something that is kind of ambiguous in API. They don't really state where you're supposed to measure that from, um, but being the owner, we like to see it measured from the nearest side just to make sure that we're covering all bases and we don't have to come back in 10 years and fix that for some reason. The next thing I'm going to talk about is grounding lug connections, which we see this as an issue on uh, the majority of tanks that we go out and inspect. Um, the AW standard sheet EDO2 gives the detail. API also gives a detail which is very similar to what we have. The major difference is the exothermic weld that is required between the grounding cable and the grounding lug. A lot of times it's just a bolted connection or even then it's painted over and then connected, which does no grounding at all. 
So this is a detail that has a lot of things going on with it. Weld spacing issues, things attached directly to the shell to bottom weld. But what I'm drawing attention to on this one is the grounding connection where it's a clamped on connection to the grounding cable. And then it is, appears to be threaded on to the grounding screw, I guess we'll call it, that is then welded onto the tank shell. Not sure how effective that would be at grounding the tank. It does not meet our standard detail, doesn't meet API's detail. So that is something, and this tank was built in 95, so it is something that we see on a lot of recent tanks and that we would want to correct. Thankfully, it's a pretty easy correction to make. This is one we'll also see a lot of times where it is just tack welded onto a slotted bottom. Uh, that is not acceptable. We don't like that. Thankfully, there is enough cable there to where they can just grind that off, move it up, put on a welding, put on a grounding lug, and then go from there, and it should be pretty good, simple fix. One that we'll see a lot of times and have to uh, uh, correct on a lot of inspections and that can lead to a lot of wear and tear on the tanks is the stilling well base guides not being attached to the stilling well. There is a gap in here in our newer standard. We've updated it to show a quarter inch gap there. But note one on here also says to do not attach the guide supports to the stilling well. This is the 2015 standard. So it is in there stating to not attach the guide supports to the stilling well. And this is sheet D07 of our AST standard. And what we'll see a lot of times, this one is bolted, not welded, but still a hard connection between those guides and the stilling well is not good. This is Langley tank six. I believe on its sister tank, there were cracks shown on this, this uh, base plate weld right there that could be weeping fuel, allowing water to get in there, causing excessive corrosion between that. For some reason, stainless steel plate welded to the bottom and that is a, a maintenance issue. It was something that kept the tank out of service for an RMMR contract to go in and fix that weld. And then as we're doing major repairs now, we're just getting rid of that base detail and updating it to our standard. So that way it, it has the ability to move up and down because these are fixed hard at the roof of the tank. So as that roof expands due to thermal expansion, we want that ceiling weld to be able to move up and down within those guides. And that on the next slide is uh, a tank that did not have a fixed roof. This is the Tyndall tanks that had some damage due to the hurricane a couple years ago. Their tanks are a geodesic dome, meaning that these stilling wells are only U-bolt connected at the top, so they are free to move at the top of the stilling well. They are only restrained laterally. So the base is what is gonna have to support the, the stilling wells vertically. So this, at first glance, you would think that this does not comply with the standard, but on tanks that have non-fixed roofs, that is, the structurally acceptable way to build these stilling wells. Now that we are going through and putting new roofs on these tanks, those welds have to be cut away and these guides have to be able to free to move separately, or the stilling well has to be able to move separately from the guides so that way it's not fixed in two places and could cause cracking on that repad weld. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the telltale holes and reinforcement plates. This is something we see all the time on tanks. Uh, API 650 gives two different requirements on telltale holes. The first paragraph, it just states that they have to be there on the horizontal center line of the nozzle and they have to be a quarter inch. The next paragraph is something that is easily missed because API sneaks it in at the top of a page right after a bunch of five pages of charts and it's right above the grounding lug detail which has nothing to do with this. So it's easy to miss, it's a quick little paragraph. Each sentence is kind of on its own but they put it in one paragraph just stating that non-circular repads have to have a rounded corner, minimum radius of two inches, has nothing to do with telltale holes. And then the next sentence is saying that pads that cover shell seams must be provided with a quarter inch telltale hole. So these would be any miscellaneous pads for conduit supports, stair supports, things that are welded over a butt welded shell course, they have to have a repad. This is one where it's a nozzle that the, repad, or the telltale hole was painted over and was not um, installed with a painter's plug. When they were painting it, they just gobbed it in there. There might be some grease in there, I don't remember exactly. But that is something that we would have the contractor go and repair, clean it out, um, install like a white lithium grease or something that will dissolve in the presence of jet fuel. So that way, although API requires them to be open to the atmosphere, a lot of customers don't like it. We'll try to install that white lithium grease or a quarter inch threaded turn down elbow, something to keep water out of there while still allowing any jet fuel that may 
get into that interstitial space between the repad and the tank shell due to a cracked weld. So that way it can leak out of that telltale hole, indicating that there's a leak that the operator should be checking for. So that was that telltale that's been painted over. Typically they'd be installed with a painter's plug, which is this next one, this little guy right here. That is the telltale hole that has a painter's plug installed in there. They would paint over that and then after they're done, they would go through and remove that, thus leaving it open to the atmosphere and not covered with paint. A lot of times those just don't get removed. Um, their, their QC checklist may miss it or they'll just overlook it. And so we'll see those a lot of times. Very easy fix though, going out and just removing that. But it's something that is now non-compliant with API. The operators can't see if there's fuel back behind there. And this is what I was talking about, uh, new bulk storage tanks at Grissom, where the repad up here is covering one of these shell seams. It should be installed with a quarter inch telltale hole. I believe it was there. The contractors just had to remove the coating that was over it. And so that is a, a pretty good example of things that we'll see uh, with uh, the repads and that, that paragraph is easily overlooked. So a lot of contractors will miss that. And then that is all I had to say. So any questions or comments, there's my email. Um, you can send them to me and I'll respond with any questions you have.